Sri Lanka-born Toronto astronomer Ray Jayardana is one of a posse of cosmic cowboys mapping the space frontier. He has stellar credentials. Ray J is a leading astrophysicist, researcher, and author. He holds the Canada Research Chair in Observational Astrophysics. In his new book, he turns his telescope on strange new worlds in search for alien planets. It is my pleasure to welcome Ray Jawardana, one of Canada's top 40, under 40, to Studio 4 to tell us more. Good to be here, Fanny. Nice to meet you. Great meeting you. Mm. So, 15 years ago or so, we thought there were nine planets. Yes. Even you thought there were nine planets, true? That's all we knew about. Um, and then we lost one. Remember, we lost Pluto, or yes. we demoted Pluto. What was that about? Pluto's now a star or something, or what? It's what we call a dwarf planet now. So what happened was astronomers started to discover these icy bodies in the far reaches of our own solar system that were roughly the size of Pluto. They had their own moons like Pluto. Mm. So we either had to kind of elevate a tenth planet or demote Pluto. I see. And we chose to do the latter to, you know, the great chagrin of many people mm. who were, you know, were mad at astronomers for well, doing that. Well, especially Pluto, the Walt Disney dog. I know, I know. Yes, but when you say a dwarf planet, is that a brown dwarf? No, it's another it's more, kind of yeah, dwarf. It's, it's smaller than the, the regular planets that we have in our solar system. Okay. We created a new category, basically. That's, so today, yeah. how many planets are there, So do you now, think? So, well, not, not we think, we actually know of over 500 other planets now orbiting other stars, other suns mm. than our own. So instead of knowing about the one planetary system, our solar system, now all of a sudden we know about literally hundreds of other solar systems. And that's a huge change in our perspective. No kidding. Yeah. A huge change philosophically, uh, religion-wise. The implications Science are quite wise. great. Yeah, absolutely. The, the great implications of not just speculating, but actually knowing that mm -hmm. there are so many other planetary systems, and we're discovering an incredible diversity of worlds that we just hadn't imagined before. You know, just judging from our own little planetary system, you know, we, we, we had a fairly limited mm. sense of what they could look like. And now we have this incredible range of planets and planetary systems out there. Uh, that really are changing our, our view of uh, the cosmos. And do you call these extrasolar planets, ex -plan exoplanets? exoplanets? Both, both those words are used. Oh. Uh, they just mean planets orbiting stars other than the sun, right? Planets beyond our solar system. But they're all still in our galaxy. They're still in our cosmic neighborhood, relatively speaking. I see. Yeah. But beyond our galaxy. Beyond, no, in our galaxy, but beyond our solar system. OK, beyond our solar system, in our galaxy, galaxy. what about other galaxies? Oh, so uh, I mean, the universe is a big place. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we, we know of, of over 500 extrasolar planets. But our galaxy alone is made of over 200 billion stars. So the sun is just one of over 200 billion stars. And there might be about 80 billion galaxies like it that we know of. So the numbers are really mm -hmm. astounding. <laughs> and on Earth, yes, are we living on the debris from the sun? We're, we're living on the debris left over from the formation of the sun. So when the sun formed, there was some leftover gunk, <laughs> leftover, <laughs> gu leftover dust and gas right. that uh, was in the form of a flat disk rotating around the sun. And we think our planets uh, in our planetary system coalesced out of that uh, mm. material. And, and why did that happen? What makes that happen? Well, it's, it's, it's one of the questions that we study, uh, astronomers study today. So one of the things we already know is when we use telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope, or even the big telescopes on the ground in Hawaii and Chile that, that I get to use, my students get mm. to use, um, you know, we can actually confirm that most stars, when they're born, are surrounded by this uh, material of dust and gas. So most stars have the stuff to make planets, right? We knew that for now about 30 years. What we didn't know is whether that actually happens, right? It's one thing to have the building mm -hmm. blocks. It's another thing to actually, you know, put them together mm -hmm. to make planets. And now in the last 15 years, we know that they do go into making planets. And we understand some of that process, how these dust particles stick together, grow, maybe they get to a big enough size, they attract each other gravitationally, you know, they build up into right. bigger planets and then they um, acquire a big atmosphere, for example, uh, which is important for life. We need the Earth's atmosphere, mm -hmm. right, um, to live, to breathe. Um, so it's a, it's a complex process, and we don't understand all of it, but we understand it way better than we did, you know, just a couple mm -hmm. of decades ago. Why is that? Uh, better technology? Excellent question. 
Yes, um, a lot of it is actually better technology. Um, it's also, you know, astronomers um, thinking outside the box and, mm -hmm. and thinking of better ways to answer these questions. But it's also certainly technology. So bigger telescopes, but also better technology. So there's a technology, for example, that we use um, just a three years ago now to take the first pictures of planets orbiting other stars. Now, of the 500 odd planets, we've talked about the extrasolar planets, most of them are not seen directly. We, see, we infer their presence from the fact that the star is wobbling because the planet is tugging on it, or we see the star dimming every once in a while because mm -hmm. the planet is passing in front. But in a few cases, in just in the last three years, we've managed to take direct pictures of planets orbiting other stars. And that's a revolution. That's really, you know, having, yes. we have a first family portrait of a planetary system now. So there is such a thing as the wobble effect. Yes. Uh, the history of extrasolar planet discovery is fraught with uh, conflict, as you know. Absolutely. Claims and counterclaims claims. going way back to the 1600s. Uh, there was that uh, gentleman, Giordano Bruno. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what was he doing then? So he was, he was a, 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 a philosopher, I guess, more than a kind of a, yes. a practical scientist. But he wrote about how, you know, given how many other suns there are, in the universe that there's got to be other worlds like ours elsewhere. And this, of course, went against the grain of the doctrine at the time, mm -hmm. uh, which made him rather unpopular, at least with the, uh, with the, with the Vatican. So he was burnt at stake um, <laughs> for his theoretical beliefs, among which was the idea of other worlds and life on other worlds. Yes, it was blasphemous. It, it's, it really was. Very uh, tough punishment, being burned at the stake, because you just had a feeling or a great thought that surely we're not alone. Exactly. And it's mm. a thought that many people have had over even before him over the years. It's just one thing, you know, to have ideas and thoughts and speculation, but it's another thing to have compelling evidence. Mm -hmm. So that's what's changed in the last uh, yes. 15 years or so. Well, your new book is certainly about the science of it all, but it's also about the people. Exactly. You Tell got me it. about the Hugginses. Oh, um, so this was a couple uh, uh, that were amateur astronomers, basically, in, in the UK that uh, had a lot to do with developing the techniques that we use today in terms of spectroscopy, kind of spreading the light of the stars right. into, the, you know, into the rainbow of colors and to be able to see these uh, fingerprints of different elements in that spectrum. What do you mean by fingerprints? Okay, so each element, um, like hydrogen or helium or nitrogen, they have a set of lines at a very particular set of wavelengths that are imprinted on the spectrum of a star, right? So we know we can identify those lines in the lab on Earth, and mm -hmm. then we can see them in starlight. So we know the same element must be present over there. Okay. That's how we know the composition of stars. That's how I, you know, that's how we know how what the universe is made of. Because of these lines. Exactly, and it's it's an incredible the spectra. Story. The spectra, absolutely. So lines in the spectra. You take a, you spread the sunlight into the rainbow. If you do it mm -hmm. a little bit finely, mm -hmm. then you can see these lines. And in fact, um, the element helium, which is just the number two in the periodic table, mm -hmm. was first discovered on the sun before it was discovered on the Earth. Really? Yeah, because people found this mysterious set of lines, you know, a fingerprint that didn't uh, mm -hmm. correspond to anything they knew of. And they thought, hmm, there must be a new element. And then they were able to later identify it in the lab. Mm. So it's pretty exciting. How do you take the temperature of a star? Oh, again, these lines, they really, because different elements become gaseous at different temperatures, they get ionized at different temperatures. So spectra tell us a lot. They tell us the composition, they could tell us the temperature of stars. It's, it's a very, uh, you know, there's a lot of physical information you mm -hmm. can gain from this feeble light that we catch with our telescopes down here on the ground. Yes, so when I'm uh, on my back porch, yep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not in the city, but just outside the city, and see a star. Yes. Is that a hot star, a cold star, a big star, a little star? You could tell if you knew a little bit of uh, you know, what you're looking at, right? So the mm -hmm. stars come in different colors. The hottest ones tend to be kind of bluish or whitish. The cooler ones tend to be more reddish. Mm -hmm. And that depends. The color of the star depends on the temperature of the star. So you can get a, you know, a rough estimate of yes. its temperature without even having a full spectrum just mm. from the color. And when we see a planet, yes. a Mercury, Okay. It's Mercury and Venus we see, right? The ones that are inside of our... We see a lot of planets in... Well, we see a number of planets in our solar system. But Mercury and Venus are the ones inside of the Earth. But we also see Mars. We see planet Jupiter in the night sky. We see Saturn in the night sky. And even with a small telescope, you can see the four big moons of Jupiter mm. or the rings of Saturn. 
Really? Yeah. But with the naked eye? What? No, not with the naked eye, but with a small telescope. I mean, you can mm -hmm. see the planets with the naked eye. But you, with a small telescope, you can see the moons of Jupiter and the rings around Saturn, which is quite a beautiful sight. I'll have to buy one of those. Exactly. Or go mm. to, go to you know, there are public nights at many of the observatories. Exactly. That you can uh, stop mm. by and, you know, take a peek. Mm. Absolutely. What about your first telescope? Oh, uh, you know what? I, growing up, I didn't actually have a telescope. <laughs> I was a bit more of an armchair astronomy mm -hmm. buff, a space buff. Um, as a kid, I was much more interested in space travel and, you know, being an astronaut like a lot of kids are. It was the adventure more than the science that, mm -hmm. that appealed to me when I was, you know, four, five, six years old. Uh, but that did grow into kind of a lifelong fascination with, you know, what's out there, uh, what the universe is made of, just le learning about, uh, you know, what's what you know? Mm -hmm. How do we fit in in this cosmos? Sure, but your dream as a child was to be an astronaut, yeah, a scientist, well, a school teacher. Um, I would say an astronaut at some level, but I was also mm -hmm. interested in many other things. I, you know, in college I thought I would become a journalist, and I was interested in so many different things. I'm right. still interested in politics. I'm a bit of a crazy, you know. Well, politics maybe not one day. Follow up. Are you a Canadian <laughs> citizen or American citizen? At the moment, I'm American citizen. American citizen. I just applied citizen. for Canadian citizenship. So, so you we'll can be a dual comes. citizen because yeah. Harvard, did you go on scholarship, Harvard, Yale? Yeah, I did. I yeah. bet you did. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. How'd you get on the cover of Newsweek magazine? Oh. <laughs> Hold that thought. We'll take a break and come back and you can tell me that story. Thank you. Uh, Strange New Worlds, the search for alien planets and life beyond our solar system. Ray Jawardana, known as Ray J. We'll come back. <laughs>